talk by Jonathan Bush together with uh, on work done with co-authors Henry Adams and Joshua Mirth on operations on metric thickenings. So go ahead, John. Thanks. Thank you, John. And uh, thanks a lot to the organizers for uh, allowing me to speak today. It's um, I'm really excited to share some results with you that uh, were co-authored with Henry Adams and uh, Joshua Mirth. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay, um, I'd like my talk today to be fairly applied. Um, so I'd like to start with a lot of uh, introduction and motivation before I get into the details of our paper. Um, our work is primarily motivated by applied topology and um, specifically topological data analysis or TDA. Um, to just sort of briefly describe one of the main tools of TDA, which is uh, persistent homology. The idea is that in uh, applied topology, often uh, one is given a subset of metric space or maybe a sampling of some unknown manifold. And um, given just a finite metric space, there's sort of no interesting topology associated with the metric space. So one would like to sort of thicken the space in some sense in order to compute, for example, um, the homology or the connectivity. And um, as one particular example, I have on the screen what looks like um, maybe data that was, say, noisily sampled from a circle. And um, in the TDA pipeline, we associate to this metric space a filtration of simplicial complexes where the simplicial complexes are parameterized by um, something which takes into account the metric of the metric space. Um, so I'll define a simplicial complex and some particular kinds of complexes that we use in TDA. In my particular example, um, you might say that at some particular scale, we include as all points in the metric space a vertex in the simplicial complex. And then I might join nearby points into simplices. And you can see that at this scale, if I computed the homology of the simplicial complex, I would recover the homology of the underlying circle. So the idea in TDA is to do this, not at just one particular scale, but, but all scales in order to um, say something about potentially the topology of the underlying unknown manifold. Um, so as a formal definition of a simplicial complex, we say that this is a pair, uh, V and S, which consists of a set V, which we'll call the set of vertices, and a subset S of the power set of V, which we'll call um, the set of simplices, which satisfy three properties. The first property is that every element of the set of simplices, every simplex, is non-empty and it's also finite. A simplicial complex is also closed under um, non-empty subsets. So if sigma is a simplex and say tau is a subset of sigma, which is non-empty, then tau is also a simplex. And finally, we also um, will just require that every singleton belongs to the set of simplex, sim excuse me, set of simplices, just so that the set V um, really consists of the set of vertices of the simplicial complex. One particular kind of simplicial complex, which is used um, often in TDA is uh, in the persistent homology pip pipeline is the Viatoris Rips simplicial complex. Um, at scale R, this is defined on a metric space and it contains for every finite subset of the metric space, which has a bounded diameter, we'll say that that subset is a simplex in the simplicial complex. And I just wanted to emphasize that Today, when I'm referring to Viator strips complexes, I'll always be using the less than or equal to convention. Although you could equally um, just as well define this with the strictly less than convention and all of the results that I'll describe also have analogs in that, in that case. As an example, uh, maybe the blue points are just points sampled out of the plane R2, uh, just with the standard Euclidean metric. And the Viatoris Rips complex at scale R 
here I've drawn a ball of radius r over two, so that if two balls intersect, then the centers of those balls are within, are uh, less than or equal to r away from each other. So that in my example, I would have these two points connected in a one simplex, these points connected similarly for these. The four points themselves are not all, um, they have a diameter slightly larger than r, so I don't include any higher simplices um, for those four points. Over here, I have three points which are within diameter r from each other. So not only do I include these two simplices, but I also include, sorry, the one simplices, but I also include the two simplex, which is made up of those three vertices. And similarly, I have a few more one simplices, and this point just gets a vertex. There's a few more quick examples. Um, maybe the curve on the left again is just a subset of the Euclidean plane. And at small scales, I have every single point along the curve as a vertex. And I connect two points if they are close enough together. And I connect, say, three points if they're close enough together, as well as arbitrarily high dimensional simplices. In the simplicial complex, I don't allow simplices with an infinite number of vertices. However, in the Viator Scripps complex of this curve, I do have arbitrarily high simplices. So you'd say that the dimension of the simplicial complex is infinity. Similarly for the circle, I might have all of these um, high dimensional simplices near the circle. And um, just as one particular example, if this is the circle equipped with uh, the intrinsic metric so that it has total circumference two pi, then if r is equal to two pi over three, I would include all of these equilateral triangles as well. So I'd have this equilateral triangle as a two simplex, all rotations of that triangle, and all of these simplices of arbitrarily high dimension near the circle as well. The Vitor strips complex is just an abstract simplicial complex. It's not a topological space. It's just the combinatorial data, which is somehow encoding um, nearby points. But to any simplicial complex K, we can give this um, a topology by defining the geometric realization of K. Um, we'll denote this with two vertical bars. And you can think of this as a functor from the category of simplicial complexes to the category of topological spaces. Um, this won't be particularly relevant for my talk, but I wanted to point out that when I'm talking about the category of simplicial complexes, the morphisms are just uh, simplicial morphisms, which means that um, these are set maps on the underlying vertices, such that if sigma is a simplex in um, say K, and if this is a map to a simplicial complex J, then sigma, sorry, F of sigma is a simplex in, in, in J. So it sort of preserves the simplicial structure. As a set, the geometric realization is defined to be just the set of formal convex combinations of points which make up the vertices of simplices in K. So if, for example, X naught through Xn is a simplex in K, and I take every formal convex combination of, of those vertices, and I do this over every simplex in K. That's the underlying set. Now let me describe um, how the topology is defined, and I'll do this just for um, a finite simplicial complex, meaning it has a finite number of vertices because the topology is easier to describe, um, but hopefully it will give you an idea of how it's defined in general. Um, on the left, I have what's supposed to represent an abstract simplicial complex made up of these vertices, one simplices and a two simplex. And on the right is sort of how you would visualize the geometric realization as a topological space. And the idea is that, well, just as an example, given just say a two simplex, we define the geometric two simplex to be the convex hull of the three basis vectors in R3. Um, and this is with the uh, subspace topology inherited from, from Euclidean space. And that's how we would define just a single simplex. To do this for a simplicial complex, 
we just need a sufficiently high dimensional Euclidean space. And you would, for example, order the vertices of the simplicial complex, um, assign to each vertex a basis vector in R, say Rn, take these convex holes according to the simplicial complex structure, and then the inherited, the, the subspace topology is the topology of the, the geometric realization. It turns out that one can prove that the geometric realization of the simplicial complex is metrizable, if and only if it's locally finite. Um, by definition, metrizable means that um, we can give the space a metric such that the induced topology is homeomorphic to the geometric realization. Locally finite means that every vertex is contained in only a finite number of simplices. So, um, in my first example, uh, the simplicial complex that I described earlier, that would be a locally finite uh, via torus rips complex. Both of these two spaces, if I defined the via torus rips complex, um, would not be locally finite. For example, every, let's say scale epsilon, every point on the circle would be connected to infinitely many neighbors, and you would have infinitely um, arbitrarily high dimensional simplices. Okay, so just to sort of review, this is part of the, the TDA pipeline, and we take a metric space, typically a finite sample of some underlying uh, manifold or metric space. Uh, we define a filtration of simplicial complexes or just one particular complex, which is something like the Viotorus Rips complex. And then we take the geometric realization of the complex to get a topological space. The next few steps in TDA would be to compute the homology and then to track, for example, um, generators of homology as that scale increases. Um, this composition to go from metric spaces to topological spaces, this gives a bifunctor from the category of metric spaces across this poset zero to infinity um, to topological spaces. And Again, this is not particularly relevant for things that I'll describe, but in the category of metric spaces, um, the maps are short maps or one Lipschitz maps. There are some things that you might consider to be uh, disadvantages of the geometric realization. Um, the first thing is that the geometric realization at scale zero um, in other words, where we just have all of the vertices of the simplicial complex and no higher simplices, the geometric realization might not even be homotopy equivalent to the space that we started with. So for example, with the circle at scale zero, the Viator Scripps complex at scale zero, the geometric realization is just a set of vertices or the set of points in the circle with the discrete metric. A related issue is that the obvious inclusion, which just takes a point in the metric space to the corresponding geometric realization of that vertex isn't continuous unless M is discrete. So one solution to these, um, what you might consider problems with the geometric realization is to instead equip the underlying set of the geometric realization with the topology that's induced by the one Wasserstein metric. Um, so, the underlying set here, again, is just that set of formal convex combinations. And I'm going to identify every point in the metric space X with the Dirac delta measure centered at X. And I'll justify this identification in just a minute. Um, the precise definition of the Wasserstein metric is not important for the rest of my talk, but I'd like to give you an idea of how, how the Wasserstein metric uh, looks. In this picture, the blue points and the red points are meant to indicate vertices of two different simplices. So the first is a two simplex with these blue vertices. And we also have a three simplex consisting of these red vertices. And the fractions are meant to indicate barycentric coordinates of a single point in the red simplex and a single point in the blue simplex. 
the point in the blue simplex has weights one third, one third, and one third. So that's in this convex combination, these are the lambdas. So that point is somewhere, say, here. And similarly, the red point is somewhere here. And the Wasserstein uh, metric tells me that the distance between those two points is equal to the least amount of work that it would take for me to move the red points to the blue points. If I, for example, imagine that the points represent uh, piles of dirt, where these coefficients represent the mass of the pile. So um, the least amount of work possible for me to make all of these red and blue piles coincide would be to take these two red piles to this blue pile and to take these two blue piles to these red piles here. So the black lines are meant to indicate the optimal matching. And the total amount of work that that takes is declared to be the distance between these two points. Um, and I also wanted to mention that the, the Wasserstein metric is sometimes called the, <coughs> the earth movers metric for that reason. So this space equipped with the Wasserstein, uh, with the topology induced by the Wasserstein metric, we'll call the Viatoris rips metric thickening. And as a set, again, this is just the set of formal convex combinations. Here I require, so if, if x is zero through xn is a simplex in the Viatoris rips complex, then I'll take the convex coefficients, sorry, convex combinations of those points where I'm identifying x, say xi with delta centered at xi, with the direct delta measure centered at xi. It turns out that at scale zero, um, this space is homeomorphic to the original, to the underlying metric space. And additionally, the inclusion from the metric space into the Viatoris rips metric thickening is continuous and it's an isometry onto its image. And this is the justification for um, identifying X with delta X in the definition. So the Viatoris rips metric thickening does actually preserve some of the metric, or pres preserves all of the metric space information coming from M. This gives a bifunctor um, where the only difference between this and the geometric realization is that now we're landing in um, met category of metric spaces. More generally, we can define this special metric thickening of any complex K, where again, as a set, we take all of these convex coefficients, sorry, convex combinations. I just require that X is zero through Xn is a simplex in K. And again, I equip this with the Wasserstein metric. This definition first appeared in a paper called Metric Reconstruction via Optimal Transport. It was co-authored by Michael Adamashik, uh, Henry Adams, and Florian Frick, 2018. While the space is, so if M is not, uh, sorry, if the simplicial complex is not locally finite, then we know that uh, necessarily these have different topologies because um, this simplicial complex is not metrizable in that case, but they have conjectured relationships. So I'd like to describe um, just briefly uh, the homotopy type of the Viatoris rips complexes defined on the circle, the geometric realization. Um, it turns out that for small enough scales, one recovers the circle. The idea is that really we just have the circle with all of these um, arbitrarily high dimensional simplices, but still simplices which are close enough to the circle that the um, space that we get is really just essentially a solid torus. So we get S1 back um, at the first critical scale, which is uh, two pi over three. It turns out that the space is homotopy equivalent to an infinite wedge sum of two spheres. And in fact, this is an uncountable infinity as well. Up until the next critical scale, the space is homotopy equivalent to a three sphere. Um, and then this pattern continues. These critical values are uh, things like two pi over three, four pi over five, six pi over seven, um, et cetera. Turns out that the Viatoris rips metric thickening, um, as far as we know, behaves very similar to the geometric realization in some ways. Specifically, we know that up to including the first critical scale, um, 
sorry, up to, but not including the first critical scale, the space is again, homotopy equivalent to a circle. And then right at that critical scale, it's actually homotopy equivalent to a three sphere. So we somehow miss this infinite wedge sum of even dimensional, or sorry, of uh, two spheres. And it's conjectured that this pattern continues where at the endpoints, we get what you might consider to be sort of the correct topology, which is just an odd dimensional sphere. And the homotopy types of the geometric realization were determined using simplicial methods, um, very combinatorial. Whereas the homotopy types of the metric thickenings um, were determined with geometric techniques. And I just wanted to emphasize that it's, it's really the topology of the metric thickening which allows for these geometric techniques. It allows for certain convenient maps to be continuous, whereas with the geometric realization, those maps are um, very far from continuous. Okay, so with all of that background notation out of the way, I um, can describe the category of simplic uh, simplicial metric thickenings. After I describe the category, I'll um, define the category, I'll give you some properties, and then also um, describe some results that we proved about, for example, gluings. Um, or products of simplicial metric thickenings. So as a definition, I'll have you um, recall the definition of a comma category, which is given the data of two functors, say S from A to C, T from B to C. The comma category of S and T has as objects all triples, A, B, and phi, where A is an object of A, B is an object of B, and phi is a map in the category C from SA to TB. As in morphisms, we have all pairs FG, where F is a morphism from say A to A prime, G is a morphism from B to B prime, such that in the category C, after we apply the functors S and T, we have a commutative diagram. We can define the restricted, the so-called restricted comma category, which is just the full subcategory um, such that and that phi is an isomorphism. And this is sort of the convenient definition that we'll use for the um, category of simplicial metric thickenings. So we'll define this category of metric thickenings to be the restricted comma category of these two functors. Both of these functors are just the forgetful functors. U is the forgetful functor from metric spaces to set, it just takes a metric space to the underlying set. Um, what it does on morphisms is obvious, it's just the set maps. Similarly, this map, or sorry, this functor, say box not, is a functor from the category of simplicial complexes to the category set, where we take a simplicial complex and we just map that to the underlying set of vertices. Um, and again, it's sort of obvious how this behaves on, on maps. So an object of this category is a triple, say M, K, and phi where M is a metric space, K is an abstract simplicial complex, and phi is an isomorphism of the vertex set of the simplicial complex and the underlying set of the metric space. As a theorem, we prove that if, uh, if the category of metric spaces and the category of simplicial complexes both admit limits over small diagrams of shape J, then so does the category of metric thickenings. And, um, I'll give you a, a sketch of the proof. And what I want to emphasize is that um, the proof is something which is much more general. So we actually um, were able to exploit the notation or the language of category theory to prove some statements about the category of metric thickenings um, and what could be applied to much more general situations. So um, for this proof, we use an intermediate lemma, which is just in terms of essentially arbitrary categories we fix categories A, B, and C in functors S and T to get the comma category, the restricted comma category of S and T, then you can prove that if you um, take a small index category J, suppose that A and B admit limits over J-shaped diagrams, and you suppose that T preserves those same limits, then the restricted comma category admits limits over J-shaped diagrams. And there's, of course, the analogous statement, which is, uh, given all this data, if, if A and B admit limits over J-shaped diagrams and S, sorry, co-limits, and S preserves co-limits, then the restricted common category admits co-limits over J-shaped diagrams. In the case of limits, um, 
this is the setup for the comma category with our two forgetful, func forgetful functors. Um, one can show fairly easily that this functor uh, box not has a left adjoint, which is the trivial complex functor, which just takes a set to the simplicial complex, which has that set as the set of vertices and no higher simplices. Um, that's a left adjoint to box not, so this functor is continuous and um, t preserves limits. So we can apply the, the previous lemma. In particular, this tells us that the category of metric thickenings has all finite products. And a similar argument can be used to show that um, using the fact that metric spaces and simplicial complexes have wedge sums, the category of metric thickenings also has wedge sums. Okay, so just as before, when we took a simplicial complex and defined a topological space via the geometric realization, we'll take a metric thickening and define a topological space via a metric realization functor. By definition, this is specified on objects. Say we have um, script K, which is a metric space, a simplicial complex, and an isomorphism of sets. In metric thickenings, we define the metric realization to be the set of convex combinations such that x0 through xn in my combination of uh, delta masses, this needs to satisfy the condition that under the isomorphism, this indeed is a simplex in k. So I'm just translating points in the metric space are necessarily um, under this isomorphism are a simplex in k and we'll equip this with the Wasserstein metric. On morphisms, say fg, we let the metric realization be the morphism, which is defined in sort of the obvious way. It takes convex combination of Dirac delta masses to the same convex combination of delta ma <coughs> excuse me, delta masses now centered at um, the f of xi. You'll notice that g is sort of irrelevant here, um, and you can just check that that's because we're requiring these maps to be isomorphisms. Okay, so we can obtain the via torus rips metric thickening in particular by precomposing the metric realization with the via torus rips functor. Um, you could consider this to be a bifunctor if I allow R to vary, but for a particular R, this is a functor from metric spaces to metric thickenings, um, which is given by take a metric space M and map it to the triple M, the via torus rips, simplicial complex defined at R, at scale R, and just the identity map on the underlying sets. And then as some notation, we'll define this functor, the via torus rips metric thickening to just be the composition of these two functors, which goes from met to met. So this is the, the um, sort of the analog of that beginning of the TDA pipeline that I showed earlier with the three boxes, um, now landing in metric spaces rather than topological spaces. Okay, so with all that notation out of the way, um, I can describe some results about products and gluings of metric thickenings. Um, we have as a theorem that for any simplicial metric thickenings, say K and L, the metric realization functor um, factors over the product up to homotopy. So the product of the metric thickenings is the metric thickening of the products. And um, one can use this to show that for any metric spaces M and N, we have that the via torus rips metric thickening of the product is homotopy equivalent to the product of the metric thickenings. And the proof sort of goes like this. Well, as simplicial complexes, the via torus rips complex of the product is isomorphic to the product of the via torus rips complexes. Uh, this is, straightforward to show because uh, the product of the metric spaces is equipped with the L infinity norm so that uh, the diameter of any subset in the product is just the maximum of the diameter of the two projections, which means that if a subset in here is of diameter less than or equal to R, then the corresponding subsets over here are of uh, the appropriate diameter as well. So we have an isomorphism of metric thickenings and by the previous theorem, 
the metric thickening of the product here factors over um, the product. Similarly, one can show that for any metric spaces M and N, we have that the Viatoris rips metric thickening of a wedge sum is homotopy equivalent to the wedge of the individual metric thickenings. This is a little bit harder to show specifically because we no longer have that nice isomorphism of simplicial complexes. Here I have a picture of the wedge sum, um, sorry, of the simplicial complex defined on the wedge sum versus the wedge sum of the simplicial complexes. Um, so you have to be a little bit more careful in the analogous theorem about just uh, general metric thickenings is a little bit harder to write down, but one can show that in this specific case for the Viatoris rips complexes, um, everything goes through and we still have a, a homotopy equivalence. There are similar results for check simplicial complexes, um, which are similar to the Viatoris rips complexes and are also used in TDA uh, with analogous statements about products and wedge sums. And just as a point of comparison, the proofs of these two statements actually work for arbitrary metric spaces M and N. And um, previous work on sort of the analogous simplicial complexes, the geometric realization versions, typically, um, I believe in the first reference here, um, they require the metric spaces to be finite. And in the second reference, the infinite and the finite cases need to be treated separately for the proof. Um, so it's just the utility of the, the language of category theory will allow our proofs to go through um, sort of all at once. I'll end with some open questions. First question is, does the stability of persistent homology for Viatoris rips or check complexes apply also for the simplicial metric thickenings version? Um, the stability of persistent homology, this says that if two metric spaces are close in say chromov hausdorff distance, then the out, output of uh, persistent homology, which is these um, barcodes where we're tracking the generators of homology, and the output of those two things are close in what you might, what's called the bottleneck distance, for example. Um, so up to perturbations of the metric space, the output of persistent homology is uh, stable. Does this also apply for the simplicial metric thickenings? Um, that is a question that we'd like to investigate more. And additionally, we'd like to um, better understand how the homotopy types of Viator strips metric thickenings and similarly the check thickenings are affected if one allows for measures with infinite support. So in my definition of the Viator strips complex, I allowed only finite subsets of vertices. If we allow an infinite subset of points of bounded diameter and we give this the Wasserstein metric, how does that affect the homotopy type um, of the space. And I think that this is all that I have prepared for today. So uh, thanks a lot for your attention. Thanks very much. Everybody can clap silently or, or not as they wish. Are there any, I guess uh, Brendan has a question. No, that's applause. Not a oh, okay. Are there any questions? If you have a question, I guess you can just ask. Is that true? People can unmute themselves. Yes, people can unmute themselves. I'll ask something. Uh, have you considered any sort of results for different filtrations of whatever, whatever space you start out with other than the obtaining the Viatoris rips or check complexes? Mm. So I will say that most of uh, what's written in the paper is um, something which would transfer fairly immediately to any sort of simplicial complex. We sort of um, focused on the Viatoris rips and check complexes just because we're coming from TDA. Uh, I will say that the only thing that comes to mind which wouldn't immediately transfer easily to arbitrary, so to some arbitrarily defined simplicial complex would be that statement about wedge sums um, factoring up to homotopy. Um, but I think that the rest of, of the material uh, applies to just essentially arbitrary metric thickenings. Thank you.
question. Uh, any other questions? Okay, I'll thank the speaker again. Uh, Thank you so much. Yeah, that was great. I liked it a lot.